let me uh, thank James for, for, for those kind words um, and thank everyone else that had something to do with making this possible. Um, let me start with an apology, first of all. When I first thought about doing this lecture, I sent as, uh, as my title something having to do with friendship. That's actually the mainstream of, of my research, institutional forms of friendship on the African continent. But when it, I was told that uh, the main audience might be Dr. Aladu's class on myth and folklore, I immediately changed my title and thought it might be fun to play around with something that was actually relevant to the class rather than um, you know dragging you across campus to hear some guy speak that you've never heard of and he's speaking about some topic uh, that, that's not relevant. So yeah, so I've challenged myself to try and say something about about myth. Um, there are clearly people that I see in this room who know way more about myth and folklore than, than I do, so I'm treading on other folks' territory. But again, this is what we academicians call fun, uh, moving into other people's territory. So what I'm gonna try and do here is, is tell you a myth, a myth from a place where I work in, in northwestern Zambia. I need to give you a few caveats, however, before I, I tell you this, this myth. One, don't generalize from the myth that I'm about to tell you. I mean, Africa is a huge place. Uh, it is so big, so diverse, geographically, politically, ethically, linguistically, culturally, in every imaginable way, that there's absolutely nothing I can say about Africa that would be true for everywhere in Africa. So keep this in mind. This is a specific story about a specific place and can't see this very well, but uh, again, that specific place is Zambia. And this is not even a Zambian story because Zambia itself has about 84 different ethnic groups. This is just the story of one of those groups, somewhere like Tanzania. And again, I'm sorry, I'm wired over here, so I can't go over. But even somewhere like Tanzania, where we think, well, everyone speaks Swahili there, right? Yeah, but there's still about 100 different ethnic groups. Or Nigeria, there's probably an ethnic group for every day of the year. There are those who would suggest if you could really do a, 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 a map of the ethno-linguistic groups of Africa, the map would probably look something more like, like this. So again, specificity, I'm talking about one place. See that little thing that says Lunda? This is the, the area that I'm going to be talking about today, right there in sort of South Central Africa. And the, the poor Lunda had the misfortune uh, back in 1884, 1885, at the Conference of Berlin, when the Europeans were drawing lines on the map, they were split into three segments. One third of them ended up, oh, this is really horrible. Can you see any better than I can? <laughs> uh, anyhow, you guys know the map, I'm sure. Anyhow, one third of them end up, you can turn the light back up if it's not gonna be any better. <laughs> one third of them end up in Zambia, in English-speaking territory, one-third of them end up in Angola, a Portuguese-speaking territory, and one-third of them end up in the Congo, a French-speaking territory. Uh, the one-third that ended up in that Zambian area, uh, again, are called the Lunda Indimbu, but I'm just going to generalize it to the Lunda. But anyhow, so the, the major point being, don't generalize. This is a very specific story about a very specific place, and I'm going to challenge myself and challenge you to think that, yes, this is an old story on the one hand, but there are relevance, there's meaning, there are signposts, there are reasons why this story continues to resonate today and, uh, and, and, and why it's quite meaningful today. Secondly, let me be clear about the definition of myth that I'm going to be using here today. I'm sure it, it, it probably parallels something you've been using in your class. Myth, it's a narrative, first of all. It could be oral or written. It's set in some timeless past. It's generally about some supernatural forces or, or beings. It's held to be sacred by some. I mean, there's always some that say, eh, I don't think that story is sacred. But there are some who hold the story to be sacred. It's rich in symbolism and it's held to provide guidance and insight into contemporary affairs, okay? A narrative, timeless past, supernatural beings and forces, 
rich in symbolism, held to provide some sort of guidance for contemporary affairs. Two, three, the story that you're about to hear, there is no definitive version. I have probably heard this story 50 times over the 30 years that I've been going to this little corner of Africa and I'm not quite sure I've ever heard the same version twice. And in fact, no one ever claims that their version is the definitive version because in order for it to be definitive, you would have had to have been there at the beginning. And so people always couch their stories, envelop their stories in kind of cautionary language. Anchu Ahosha, people say, or I heard someone tell this story once, or the old people, they say this. Anchu Ahosha, people say. So these stories are always kind of, you know, there's always some qualifiers. Three, my little, uh, excuse me, my little fourth caveat before we begin. This story contains three characters, only three characters. One, you can see this at least good, in Zombie, God. Then there's these two other people, Samunchu and Nyamunchu. And if I can escape just a teeny bit here, well you can see from here, those of you who know anything about African languages, the important part is always on the end, right? And in this, these two terms, and I just want to call your attention to it very, very quickly. They're strange terms, even among the Lunda. These two terms only occur in this story. They don't occur anywhere else in daily discourse whatsoever. Ntu means something to do with people in almost all of the so-called Bantu areas of Africa. Ntu, something to do with people. And some places, and then the, you put something on the front of it which makes it a little bit more descriptive. Some places it's Ba, Bantu. In some places, boo, buntu. Some places, plural would be wa, wantu. But among the Lunda, it's mu, tu. Means one single person. Antu, antu a hosha. The people say antu, no. A single is muntu. So we got muntu, muntu, person, person, singular, person. But then this sa in front is kind of ambivalent. I've glossed it here as Mr. Person, Sabunchu, and Mrs. Person, Nyamunchu. But it can also mean father of. My daughter was born out in the, that little northwestern corner of Zambia. Her local name was Kankinza. And from the moment she was born, little Kankinza, no longer did anyone ever call me James again or Pritchett. I became Sa Kankinza. My wife became Nya. Kankinza, father of. So these are strange names. This is father of a single person, mother of, it's, it's odd. Normally if it were just simply a man, a woman, it would be Iyala, Mumbanda. So there's something odd about that and you'll hear more. <laughs> Lastly, before I begin the narrative, let me tell you that most of those versions that I've heard, the 50 versions that I've heard, most of them are X-rated or maybe double X or maybe even triple X. Even the milder versions are at least mature audiences only. Um, so I'm going to tone the story down. Not that you're not a mature audience, but I know that long after I'm gone, you will have forgotten my name. You will have forgotten what I talked about. You'll be saying, oh, yeah, yeah, that guy who came and told us those dirty stories. So I'm not going to be that guy. But it won't take much imagination to figure out at what point this story can get quite raunchy, okay? So, anyhow, the story. On the edge of the great forest, Anchua Hosha, people say. In Zambi, the great god, created and placed two humans, the two original humans, Nyamunchu and Samunchu. They each had their own little separate house from which they would depart every day and spend the entire day laboring in their own little individual gardens. They would return each evening to their own house, prepare their own individual meal, and retire to their own bed. They were two identical sexless beings, undifferentiated by biology, undifferentiated by culture, by innate characteristics, undifferentiated by any acquired habit two identical sexless beings. They lived parallel lives, 
virtually always within eyesight of one another, yet never cooperating in any productive task, never crossing that little distance in the clearing that separated their two houses, never sharing a leisurely moment, never even exchanging casual greetings. Two identical sexless beings. It is said that Samunchu became increasingly frustrated by this endless cycle of solitary activity. He, if we can indeed call him he at this point, was tormented by the loneliness, haunted by the disturbing existential questions. What is the purpose of life? Why is Nzambi made two of us? Why did the two never interact? Did Nzambi have some sort of plan for them? Anyhow, growing anxiety compelled Samunchu to seek out answers. Thus he trekked, trekked seven days, seven nights to reach the center of the great forest where Nzambi dwelled. There he asked N N uh, Nzambi, what is the purpose? Why have you made Nyamuchu and me? We have nothing to do with one another. We're identical in every way, every thought, every deed. We have nothing even to say or share with one another. And Zombie shook his head as he normally did and thought, hmm, you're right. Let me think about this for a while. And he went away. Upon returning, he had an idea and he reached out and he gave to, Man to, to, to Samunchu. There in his hands, he had two differentially shaped sex organs. Boom. Take these. One was a kind of long cylindrical thing, a little bit floppy. The other, a beautiful orchid of flesh. Samunchu was utterly perplexed. Not only what are these ugly things, but what do they do with these sort of existential, profound questions that I'm asking you about loneliness and the meaning of life? Trust me, says Nzambi. Take one, affix it between your legs, and take the other one back to Namunchu. But, but, complained Samunchu. I just, trust me, says Nzambi. Pick one, take the other one back. Samunchu says, well, which one should I take? The zombie says, I don't care. Just take one, stick it between your legs, and take the other one back. But no, says the zombie, trust me. So here we have Samunchu, two sex organs, walking seven days, seven nights, to the edge of the clearing in the great forest where he and Nyamunchu live. All the while thinking, this one, that one, this one, that one, Finally, on the last evening, he decided to take the long cylindrical thing. He attaches it between his legs. And in the morning, he forgets the other one. He leaves it in the fork of a tree. Now you can imagine a lot of stories around the campfires about why did he leave it? Men, absent-minded men, or all sorts of other stories you can imagine, but anyhow, so he, he leaves it in the fork of a tree. He arrives back in the clearing. He goes about his, wakes up the next morning to go about his normal duties. Yamunchu spots it. It's something different. She's enraged. Why does he have something that I don't have? So she treks off seven days and seven nights to the center of the great forest where Nzambi lives. And she begins to yell and scream at him. We have always been the same. Samunchu and I have always been the same, identical in every way. Why have you given him something that you didn't give me? And poor Nzambi says, but, but, but I gave him two. I told him to take the other one back to you. She says, I don't, he didn't show anything. He doesn't have anything. There's no evidence of anything else. Don't worry, says Nzambi. I'll make another one. And he turns to go and then he stops and thinks, well, which one did Samunchu actually take? It's just this thing, it's flopping between his legs. Okay, so he goes away, he comes back, and there he has this beautiful orchid of flesh. No, she says, that's not it. He's got this up, trust me, says Zambi. Trust me, just put it on and go back. <laughs> but, 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 trust me. So she walks seven days and seven nights 
to the clearing in the deep forest where she and Samunchu lived. She wakes up the next morning, about to go around, do her daily round of duties. Now Samunchu spots her. Whoa. <sighs> Suddenly he's overcome with feelings that he had never felt before. Passion, heat. His little organ begins to rise. And suddenly in a flash, he realizes what Nzambi's divine plan was. He rushes across that little distance that had separated their two worlds. No, she says, she pushes him away. You left my thing in the fork of a tree. Go F the tree. <laughs> oh, God. Poor Samunchu, frustrated, confused, What's a guy to do at a time like this? Well, the obvious, he walks seven days and seven nights to the center of the deep forest where Nzambi dwells. He confesses, I'm sorry, Nzambi, I, I, I didn't see the wisdom of what you were about to, trying to make happen. Nzambi, of course, forgives him. After all, Nzambi knows the weaknesses and frailties of, of his own creations. Don't worry, says Nzambi, I have a plan. And he goes away and he comes back and he gives Samunchu a fox. So there's Samunchu with a fox. <laughs> what am I supposed to do with this fox? And Zombie whispers a plan. Ah, seven days, seven nights, back to the clearing on the edge of the forest where he and Yamunchu lives. He waits until dark, throws the fox into Yamunchu's little house, runs back to his house, gets under the covers like he doesn't know anything. And suddenly he hears, he hears the roaring of the, of the fox. He hears screams and yells. He hears little footsteps running up into his door. And suddenly it's Yamunchu and she's heaving and sweating and <sighs> frightened. And she tries to explain about this terrible creature that was about to eat her alive. Samunchu says, don't worry, I know that creature. I can take care of that creature. You're safe with me. And so she spends the night. And Yamunchu and Samunchu got to know each other very well. <laughs> that morning, they woke up with a smile, a contortion of their face that they had never experienced before. But in an instant, Yamunchu remembered, the creature is out there. Don't worry, says Samunchu. It's a nocturnal creature. It won't be back until tonight. Well, can I come back tonight? Yamunchu says, Hmm, I'll fix dinner, she says. Um, okay. <laughs> if you fix dinner, then I'll go and see if I can't find something special for us in the forest. End of story. Myth, a narrative, oral or written, set in some timeless past about supernatural beings or forces, rich in symbolism, held to be sacred by some, and it provides guidance and insight into contemporary affairs. As you can imagine, stories like this are rich material, particularly in rural Africa, where, where, where I heard these stories, where most people don't have electricity, they have to finish their daily duties by sundown, and then they spend the rest of the evening sitting around listening to stories. These stories, they're wickedly entertaining on the one end. I mean, people make them as raunchy as they can simply because they're entertaining. But they also set the stage for local debates about human genesis, about the original state of existence, about the various compacts between God and, and his or her creations, about the ontological status of men and women. Such tales have enticed generations of young Lunda folks to, 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 to ponder deeply, to scrutinize intensely every little episode, thinking about what does this mean? What does that mean? What does it mean for the two original couples to be genderless? Why were humans capable of convincing God to change the original state of being? Did other creatures have that capacity? Could the zebra walk seven days and seven nights and say, uh, God, about these stripes? You know, <laughs> could the snake go and say, hey, how come I'm the only one with no legs? Is there something special about human beings that allowed us to make that trek and to change the original being? And what was this original indecision about, hmm, this one or that one? Was that meant to somehow portray the arbitrariness 
of gender assignment and the fox. In giving Samunchu the fox, is God somehow bringing into being and ordaining some sort of special relationship between males and the forest? By Nyamunchu volunteering to cook, did she seal the fate of women forever? <laughs> and there's always the question, why was it Samunchu the first to get frustrated and go walking to Nzambi? So these are the kinds of questions that in some ways form a charter, a foundational charter, a canon among the Lunda Ndimbu, not a canon that's above dispute, but a canon precisely to dispute. This is the story that says, this is the stuff that's worth arguing about. This is the, these are the contradictions that are worth mediating. These are the oppositions that we should spend time sort of figuring out. These are the worthy stories. Now, excuse me. There are hundreds of points of departure. There, every sentence of this story you could dissect and sit around all night long arguing and debating about it. I'm going to go from there and just pull out three, just three little domains. One, one I don't want to sort of challenge your patience here tonight. But let me just pull out three little areas uh, that sort of show you how myth having that founding myth sort of shapes discussions and, uh, and leave it up to your imagination to figure out the hundreds more types of discussions, discursive exercises that could flow. And I'm going to talk about that episode again of Two Sexless Beings. I want to talk about the, the, the differentiation as a prelude to cooperation. And then I want to go from talking about how Lunda talk to what does it mean in terms of the real world action right now. So, Starting with uh, the two sexless beings. Probably most of us, again, this is a Lunda story. Not all of the Africans around believe that in the beginning there were two sexless beings, some there's a man and a woman, some there's a guy and his seven beautiful daughters. There's all kinds of stories out there, but this story. I'd like you to just sort of use your imagination and compare probably looking around this audience, the, the, the sort of original myth we had about men and women. And here I'm going to quote from the Holman Standard Bible. God created the heavens and the earth, and he made Adam. You remember? How many of you remember your Bible? <laughs> okay. Remember? He made Adam first. Not two, not this. Adam. God made Adam. And I quote, and then the Lord said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him, a helper. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky, and he brought them to man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was his name. I mean, imagine how cool it must have been to be Adam. You've got God bringing you every little thing, and you get to name it, and whatever it's named, that's it. That is a hummingbird. That I shall call shark. This is Adam at the moment of creation, getting to name everything. The man gave name to all the cattle and all the birds of the sky and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a suitable helper. So the Lord God caused him to sleep. And as he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh of that place. This is just one little you know, rendition of, that one sees a lot. There's Adam over there sleeping, the little slit in his side, and God pulling woman out, fashioning a rib, and making that rib into a woman. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man, and he brought her to man. The man said, now this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she came out of man. That's the founding charter that many of us grew up with. And you think about that. God had the capacity, all of the fish, all of the fowl, the beasts of the fields, the birds of the sky were all created out of clay. Adam was created out of clay. And in fact, God had the capacity to make the entire universe out of nothing. 
but Eve stands as unique. She has to come from the rib of Adam. She is woman because she came out of man. She was created to be a helper. What is the impact of this founding charter on the societies that produced it? Myth held to be sacred by some. Maybe you don't buy into the myth, but I'm sure all of us have encountered someone that thinks that that myth is sacred. Certainly the history of discourse about the role of women, women in the church, women in society, has been colored by those who believe that myth to, to, to be sacred. Even in this country, it wasn't until, what, 1920, the 19th Amendment, when women got the right to vote. And we always talk about that, but it wasn't just the right to vote. Uh, the right to, to own land was in question until that point. Federal protection for women to have right to own land, to get bank loans, to manage your finances without the approval of a father or, 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 or a husband. Even today in places like small town Catholic Brazil, there are areas in which it is still discussed. Should women have the right to own this, right to do that? To what degree can they participate in the church? Can they be rabbis, imams, bishops, cardinals, the popes? These are still very difficult questions in a lot of places. Again, many of us do not believe the myth is sacred. We have transcended it. But my point here is not that you're a prisoner of your myth, but that myth becomes a starting point for a lot of conversations because some do believe that it is sacred. The founding myth among the Lunda doesn't start with any dominant or domineering male. There are two identical sexless beings. There's no history of the man is the boss. So the discussion there never quite goes in that direction, at least until the Europeans came along, told these people who are matrilineal that you're less than a man if you don't own your own children and you don't label your wife with your own name. But historically, you end up having a very different kind of gender discourse in these sort of places. Without having time to lay it out fully, one book I would highly recommend, uh, Maria Mabaz, So Long a Letter. She is, I think, acknowledged by some as being one of the early African feminists, but I think she might even debate the label, and there's very little that she has to say that would fit neatly into Western notions of feminism because she's not talking about how women grab men's power or move into spheres that, that men have dominated. She, and again, just to, 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 to sort of give you the briefest summary, she talks about the family as being a symphony. Maybe the man's the drum, maybe the woman is the xylophone. It's not for women to try and become drums or men to become xylophones. Sweet music requires each of them to play their own notes. She's arguing for as much respect for her xylophone, as much respect for the centrality of the xylophone as she is you know, arguing for wanting to become the bass. So there is this split, and again, there are people in the room who can talk about this more articulately than I can, this split between sort of Western discussions about feminism and African discussions of feminism. Again, wave one and wave two don't mesh at all. It's only in wave through three where African women look at Western women and say, you're trying to be like your men. And they are dominating imperialists who run roughshod over the environment and all the other peoples of the world. We're not aiming for that. We're looking for some other role. We're looking to adapt the world to the way women are. So anyhow, my point being again, people aren't prisoners of their, of their myths, but it does frame conversation. It does produce a particular starting point. And because the, the, the starting point here is different with two sexless beings, it ends up being a very different kinds of gender discourse in these particular places. One of my anthropological colleagues getting back to Zambia again, uh, an anthropologist by the name of Carla Poe, talks about a framework in which we should see at least the African societies and the regions that we study, not as one society and then who has power over what, but two societies. Men and women form different societies. She gives the term sexual parallelism, that you know, 
each of these two worlds has their, their own hierarchy, their own systems of valuation. They have their own institutions for passing along knowledge. Now the two societies do intersect at certain points of production and of course at certain points of reproduction. But overall, each is, can be seen as existentially central and separate, only intersecting at certain points. And there are lots of stories, in, particularly in this region of the world, you know, that glorify women's contribution. They're the ones that can give birth. They're the ones that nurture the village nurture. Men, men can do some interesting things. They can fight foxes. But, but all of the central stuff is women's stuff. And of course, men have different stories. Oh, all the stuff we do is the important stuff. But one really should look at them as separate societies that only intersect at certain points. This is the kind of discourse that, go, that grows out of living in this kind of society where this is your founding myth. The second thing I want to just hint at quickly is differentiation as a prelude to cooperation. Go back again to that original condition. Identical in every way. F each of them, Yamuntu, Samunchu, free to do whatever they wanted to do. Autonomous. But it was an autonomy that was enforced by lack of differentiation, a sameness of body and mind that mediated against complementarity. Indeed, there was a narrow range of possible cooperation because they are identical. They're the same in every way. So what did they have to offer one another? Nothing. Differentiation. Differentiation produces opportunities to then cooperate. You need the differentiation first. And in this case, it was the emergence of biological differences, which made possible new forms of physical interaction. And that physical interaction was pleasurable enough that people began to, that Samunchu and Yamunchu began to kind of renegotiate the labor relationships, differentiating. Well, if you do this, then, then I can do that. And indeed, this, we see this is how domestic relationships come into being. One would do one thing, one could then do the other. So sameness in this society is, is equated with blandness, needless duplication, whereas diversity can perhaps lead to exciting and more efficient interdependent action. So a lot of the Lunda stories, a lot of the Lunda proverbs, they're all about, you know, this, this, this complementarity of oppositions, the need to have oppositions in life. Now I know, you know, here in the West we can say, oh well, yeah, we have, we have notions of opposites attracting, uh, the, the sweet girls always go for the bad boys. This is not that. This is saying that they need to be brought together. Oppositions need to exist in the same physical space, the same philosophical space. You don't fear an opposition. You don't fear a contradiction. You domesticate it. You look for a way of domesticating oppositions because one cannot meaningfully exist without the other. Now, let me give you another example. This is not to say, well, women this, men this, because even within men, there's that search for oppositions, again, that must be brought into the same sphere. Among the Lunda, there are at least two types of revered males. There's males, the hunter. And again, I don't care if a guy lives in the city, works in an office, I'm a hunter. Okay, so there's the hunter, but then there's the headman as another metaphor for real man. The hunter, the celebrated big game hunter, Chibenda, they are invariably solitary persona. They spend their days alone in the dangers of the deep forest. They're the, it's the very image of someone that just prefers that sort of quiet, but yet dangerous space, as opposed to a headman who is the persona, who personifies sociability. The headman is at the heart of every celebration in the village, the epicenter of every dispute. He's the image of one who's constantly surrounded by people, offered advice here, consolation there, ever ready with the right words, the right action to smooth over the rough edges of daily village life. The kind of life that the hunter hates, does not want to be bothered with all these people and their problems, leave me with the dangers of the forest. The headman, Mwini Wamukala, Mwini Wamukala, chief of the village. But if you look at that word Mwini in a lot of other contexts, it's mother mother of the village, the nurturing man. So in Lunda lore, big men, 
the big game hunter. They are the consummate explorers, ferocious killers, clears of space. They convert the wild into the tame. They are the ones who start each new dynastic realm. You go and ask every village, who's your founder? Oh, it's a brave hunter. They can provision the village with meat. They can scare away the enemies. But they lack that nurturing and sustaining quality of the headman, the diplomacy, the tact. It is the headman that keeps the village going. The presence of each is absolutely vital to the establishment and maintenance of village life. Headmen and hunters, founder, sustainer, polar opposites in this existential configuration that is necessary to kind of encompass those extremes. So the kind of the kind of differentiation that leads to cooperation, that tames oppositions that I'm talking about is far different from, oh well, opposites attract. No, they are the epitome of one another. They can't be defined without one another. How could one define beauty in a world in which there's no ugliness? How could one be righteous in a world in which there's no evil? Indeed, some of the more amusing scenes in African encounters is when the missionaries come over and they are, they are welcomed by the Africans because you know this joint mission, we're gonna fight evil. And the Europeans have new tools for fighting evil. We got a Bible, we got this magic book, got this cross, I got some holy water. They're coming in with all kinds of tools to fight evil. But then the missionary says, yeah, we're gonna wipe evil off the face of the earth. And then the Africans say, whoa, wait a minute. We don't wanna wipe evil off the face of the earth then who do we struggle with? What do we struggle with? If there's no evil, how do I prove I'm righteous? You've got to have both within the same framework. <laughs> Anyhow, my, sorry. I have to go back to Maria Maba again, the same thing, because she writes brilliantly about minds that are trained in the traditional way, African stories, proverbs, myths that have double and triple meanings and you have to spend your life growing up trying to figure out the meaning that's relevant. You have to spend your life trying to figure out how to domesticate these oppositions in comparison to her, I'm sorry, in comparison to her own daughters that went to French school, more Cartesian, more linear. She talks about what a much more beautiful mind you know, those who are steeped in this world of domesticating oppositions rather than those who grow up in this Cartesian linear, you know, dyadic world. So, yeah, it's very different. And the last thing I wanted to talk about, again, going back to my little three things, and I'm lost there, action in the real world. I've been telling you about how the Lundas talk about stuff and how Again, a discourse, a, a mythic discourse is not a prison, it just sort of sets a stage because some believe it's sacred. What does it mean for action though in, in the real world? I wanna talk about just a, a quick couple of examples here. And I wanna go back again to that division by gender because if the idea is that you need some kind of differentiation as a prelude to cooperation, and Zambi could have done any number of things. It didn't have to be sex. He could have said, well, I'll make one of you tall so that you can get the fruit of the trees and one of you will be short, or I can make one of you fast and one of you slow, or he could have done anything, but he did choose gender, sex, differentiation. And a lot of the Lunda discourses, again, are about why that's meaningful, how do we divide things by gender, deep and meaningful discourses about how even jobs have to be gendered, spaces have to be gendered. They have taken up that pattern. The Lunda, again, I'm only speaking for them, have divided their, all of their spaces now are divided based upon gender. And that notion that I hinted at earlier, men are of the forest and women are of the village. Again, a lot of their proverbs play, play up on that. Um, men, even while sitting in the village, in fact, when they're in the village, they're usually, grumpy and they're grumbling about being in women's spaces and you know we need to go hunting um, but when you actually listening to, to to men going hunting they say why 
Mwai Mwai Sanga, which on the one hand means I'm going to the bush, but bush also means home. I'm going home. I'm tired of this village. We're going home. And men tend to go to the, the bush. Mwai Mwai Sanga. In groups of five, six, seven, eight, they go in groups. And it's not really about hunting. Some will hunt. Two or three will go off and go fishing here. Somebody else will go trapping birds or small game. Somebody else will be over here collecting wild fruits and vegetables and mushrooms. Somebody else will be collecting bark fiber to make rope. Somebody else will be collecting bamboo because someone's building a house. Two or three others are looking for medicinal plants because before men go out into the bush, they actually take orders. People see men going out into the bush and say, oh, you know, I've got this stomach ache. Can you get me some of that stomach ache medicine if you come across it? Or I've been having this cramp in my leg for the last two weeks. If you run across any of those plants, get me this. So they're, you know, so they're not hunting. They're reaping all kinds of things from, from the forest. And they're jovial. Men are never as happy. They're eating all kinds of stuff. And they talk about how in the village, oh, the food is horrible. All we get is that Inshima stuff. This cassava pounded stuff, you know, that and vegetables, you know. And out here we are out here in the bush, we get fish and we get meat and we get birds and fresh fruit, you know, and we're men and this is, this is our home and everything is, is great. But when men go out into the bush, they always carry a little flower with them and you know, and of course, it's their wives who process it and give them a bag of flour to carry with them when they go out into the bush. And I've noticed this pattern that the trips never last longer than the flour. <laughs> <laughs> but they never acknowledge it. You know, as the bag starts to get low, men start talking about, oh, I bet they miss us back at the village. <laughs> I bet the houses are falling down. They probably need us to patch up the houses, you know. Or sometimes they, they will just blatantly start talking about sex. Ah, I'm tired of being out here with you guys. Oh, sex, I'm going back home. But they never make the link that this is the umbilical cord. Even when they're in the most manly of spaces, it's because of this. And so, and so in some ways, women, this, again, this is this complementarity of oppositions. Uh, in some, some ways, women can determine how long men will stay out there. Uh, <laughs> you know, oh baby, it's a, uh, you know, <laughs> been pounding. I'm tired. Here's enough for two days, okay? Or here's enough for a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah. You, you and the guys go have fun. You know, <laughs> so so there is that, that sort of oppositions that are being being mediated here. Um, rushing ahead. Well, let's. So, so men are socialized to be men and women are socialized to be women. But let me just say a word about the kinds of action, because this is a world that's so different from ours. Ours is a world where you can be just like everybody else, as opposed to this world where, no, we women are elaborating on our womanness and men are elaborating on their their menness the stages of life out there and you can't see it so well here but uh, these are sort of the recognized stages of life where we talk about kids or toddlers or teenagers they got the the, the mukeki who's the baby in arms and there's moana which is sort of generic child Chitumpa. two three-year-olds we what do we call it? the terrible twos they call them screamers you know Chitumpas. Uh, and then there's sort of Kansi, which is a, just sort of a general, those young folks. And one, two, three, four. All four of those, in some respects, are kind of, they're, they're genderless. It's not like, I mean, you can bring in a bunch of adjectives to make it clear that this is a male versus a female mukeki, but generally nobody bothers. Clearly they know, they can look at the genitalia and say, oh, this is, this is a boy, this is a girl. In the same way that you could see that Sa Munchu at some point is gonna become man and Nya Munchu at some point is gonna become women. <laughs> they, can, they can tell the difference, but the terminology, genderless, in terms of labor and social world, social responsibility, genderless. Children belong to the mother. Their labor belongs to the mother, her, that world, it's only when they go through this ceremony here. Boys go through Muganda, girls go through Kankanga. It's only then 
that they become differentiated and super differentiated, super differentiated. Mukanda, you can ask anyone, what's a Mukanda? Oh, that's where we men turn boys into men. Kankanga, that's where we women turn girls into women. It will not happen naturally. I don't care how big you get, how old you get, until you've gone through that ceremony, you will never be a man, you will never be a woman. You'll be something, you'll be a child. So again, this harkens back to that original discourse about genderness, genderless, and some action happen, having to be taken by God. Here it is, the human society itself saying, we have to take an action, and then we're going to hyper-genderize uh, our, our people. Mukanda, this is the boys' ceremony. And the boys are initiated in groups because most men's work is in groups. They hunt in groups, they build houses in groups, they cut down the trees for gardens in groups. So men, boys, are initiated in the bush, in groups. But once again, who feeds them? Who feeds them while they're out there in the bush? They may be out there two months, six months. In the old days, late 1800s, they used to be out there for two years. Now it has been shortened to school vacation, one month. But still, it's the mom who sends out the food every day while the men are out here in this sacred space being initiated and turning into men. So we got that complementarity of oppositions. Women are initiated, turned into women in the village, individually, one by one. Because women tend to work alone. Each woman is head of her own little enterprise. She has the labor of the children but she's responsible for feeding these people, she's responsible for, for these activities. So women are initiated, transformed into women in the very middle of the village, but they're secluded. And they're secluded in something that looks like this, a little house made with forest products by the men. So we've got, and the, even the, the terminology for this is a womb. So here's this sort of male womb that now gives birth transforming a girl into a woman. And there's a counterpart too in the, with the boys, that little place where they're hiding out in the, in the bush for months. It's also called a womb, that nature will give birth to, 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 to men. So in conclusion, I need to acknowledge that not all of the Lunda live in that little northwestern corner. Many of them have now moved into the city and they've done their best, in some ways, to, to reproduce that sort of ceremonial life. Girls still have, you know, sometimes they're called kitchen parties, though kitchen parties are usually more parallel to, to, to the, uh, the bridal shower. But they have a ceremony in which all of the women who happen to be in town from this region will come together, give the girl gifts, give her advice, and the fact that she's gone through this process now signals that she is, in, in, in fact, a, a woman. Boys, in very similar fashion, will be sent, boys do circumcise here. Girls don't do a clitoridectomy or anything, but the boys do, are circumcised. But in the city, they send them to the hospital to be circumcised, and then all the men's, the fathers, the uncles will sort of hover around the boys for a few days and tell all of the, the men's stories and the bush stories and how we're hunters or we're head men, so on and so forth. And so these things are being enacted in the city as well. But nobody was ever really satisfied with the city version. It was just too stripped down, too ostentatious, the women, the men, ugh, a hospital visit, then sit around with your uncles for a week, uh, not quite the same. So what has emerged over the last decade or so is a traditional ritual back in the country, whereby once for about a week every summer, the Lunda assemble back in their home territory um, for week-long storytelling and ceremony and, and pageantry, and then those parents who can send their kids back to the bush. It's much more complicated than that in that the local folks are actually doing all the work, but the people who made it 
big in the city sort of compete with one another to send resources back home. I'll send two cows this year, I'll send three cows next year to make the, the ceremony bigger, more meaningful, more pageantry than, than ever before. And then you send your kids back so that they can then see these stories, hear the stories, enact it. And one can you know, imagine um, the kid who's going there for the very, very first time listening to these stories and wondering, Yamunchu, Samunchu, what is, what is this all about? And you can even imagine the kids who get sent back every summer saying, oh God, not that Yamunchu, Samunchu story again. Um, but it doesn't matter whether they go, whether they like it or don't like it. The fact is that the Lunda today, and this is from last year, had today have created a context, a set of stories that take place on the edge of the clearing of the great forest where Nzambi lives, where for a week at least, the kids get saturated with the same, the same aesthetic framework. They get saturated in the same worlds of symbols and myths. They get saturated with the same discursive framework that their parents have. And so even today, there is that line of continuity. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you.